Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is C. Meyer. I'm the exhibitions manager at Blue Sky uh, in Portland, Oregon. Um, and we're super excited today to have um, our exhibiting artists for May, Mishka Henner and Basim Bati here with us. Um, They're showing uh, like a multimedia exhibition, which has been really exciting to have um, a little different for Blue Sky, which has been super cool, um, called Energy Ghost. And it opened May 4th and it is um, on exhibition until next Saturday, the 27th. So if you're in the area um, or uh, able to make it to Portland to come see the show, please do. We would love to have you see it and interact um, with their exhibition. Um, I'm gonna start off um, just reading our land acknowledgement real quick. Um, we at Blue Sky humbly acknowledge that our programming is being held on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia, Wimal, and Willamette, Willamette rivers. In this online format, you may be participating from other areas, and we invite you to consider your own land acknowledgement that reflects your location. We also acknowledge that the very technology we rely on for these online programs is inequitably distributed and not equally accessible, creating new virtual displacements and exclusions. We call attention to the need for action now and in the future to address these disparities. And I'm just gonna introduce uh, Mishka and Vasim. So Mishka Henner is a visual artist born in Belgium and living in the UK. His varied practice navigates through the digital terrain to focus on key subjects of cultural and geopolitical interest. He often produces books, films, photographic, and sculptural works that reflect on cultural and industrial infrastructures in a process involving extensive documentary research combined with the meticulous reconstruction of imagery from materials sourced online. His work has featured in group shows at the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, and Centre Pompidou, Paris. His works are in the collections of the National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C., Portland Museum of Art, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In 2013, he was awarded the Infinity Award for Art by the International Center of Photography. Uh, welcome, Mishka. And Vasim Bhatti, born in Glasgow, is of Indian Pakistani descent and currently lives and works in both Manchester and Rome and is currently in Rome. <laughs> so welcome from Rome, Vasim. Also working under pseudonyms of a question mark and body topics, he has an object specific concept and process driven practice with a non medium specific approach, which attempts to deal with notions of uh, Pakistan surface questions of material truth fetishism and hierarchies and the testing of doctrines of functionality and taste. Commissions include work for artists, Lara Pavarat, Barreto, Jake and Dinos, Chapman, Banksy, Future Farmers, Agnes Meyer, Brandis, Etoy, Musicians, MF Doom, Gruff Brees, Danger Mouse, 808 State, Demdike Stair, Afrodeutsch, and Matthew Herbert, and Institutions, Modernist Society, Warp Records, Bard, Polinaria, and Pentagram. Welcome, Basim. And these are some um, install shots at the current exhibition at Blue Sky, um, it's very been it's been very fun to have um, a different approach to showing exhibitions through their work. So very excited to have you all here joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, Vasim is in Rome, and uh, Mishka, are you in Manchester? Anyway, yeah. Oh, and Mishka, you're muted. So um, let me get you on mute. All right. And and participants, or if you're here um, uh, watching, please uh, mute yourselves so that we can make sure we are able to um, hear our All right. I was looking forward to giving a talk there while muted. <laughs> <laughs> That's that like the been... ideal talk. You were like, no one can hear me. It's great. <laughs> yeah. So should, should, we, should we just start? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for coming. I see some really familiar names in the audience. Daphne, hi, Daphne. Great to see you here uh, and um, others. So thanks very much, everyone, for coming. I think it's noon for most of you. Uh, for us, it's eight o'clock at night. So you might hear some kids screaming behind me. That's my partner trying to get them to in the bath. Um, so I apologize in advance. 
Um, okay, so basically, um, it's great to be back at Blue Sky. I got an email from Christopher inviting us to come and do a show here again, and I just thought that was fantastic. Blue Sky were really um, one of the earliest supporters of my work, uh, with possibly one of the most difficult projects I've done um, that was a really polarizing project. Uh, when I exhibited No Man's Land, which was my first show in uh, the US uh, back in 2011, I think it was, uh, 2012. Um, so anyway, it was I was really excited um, to be invited back, and uh, especially with this project, um, which is a, a, which has been a collaboration with Batty, who's here, and um, Batty's handling the slideshow, but Batty, do come in. This is our project, so <laughs> yeah. if I say anything uh, that's completely wrong or whatever, or something you want to add to, just go ahead. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, it could turn into more com a more conversational presentation. It might do as we go along. Uh, but to start off with, to get the ball rolling, I'll give you some background to this project. So I don't know how many of you have visited the gallery, but um, Energy Ghost at Blue Sky, uh, because it changes every time we exhibit the work. So this is the first time we've ever exhibited it, exhibited it like this. Um, consists of uh, a video work uh, which is uh, being projected against the back wall, and then six, is it six, Batty, or nine? It's nine, it's nine yoga mats. And nine yoga mats. So we, me and Batty are very excited about printing uh, photographs on anything but photographic paper. That's way more exciting and interesting for us. So when we figured out that we could actually print on yoga mats, uh, we were just thrilled. And um, we thought, well, Portland, you know, the West Coast of America, they love yoga over there. I mean, they love yoga here as well. But you guys are the you are the what the, the mothership of yoga in uh, in the West, I think. Um, and we thought, oh, we've got to we've got to get some yoga mats made. And actually, part of this whole series is about our relationship to nature, especially in the age of climate change. And um, we've been walking this sort of knife edge between nature as something that is really beautiful and wonderful and lovely to nature as this apocalyptic killer that could wipe us off the face of the earth at any point. And we actually started this project as a, as a commission for the, in the west coast of England um, in a place called Cumbria, which is home to the to Britain's nuclear um, military and energy infrastructure. Um, and uh, so I don't know if you've heard, but there's a there's a nuclear power station in Cumbria called Sellafield, which is probably the most famous um, nuclear power station in the UK. It was it used to be called Windscale, but one of the worst nuclear accidents that has ever occurred in history happened at Windscale in the 1950s. And there was a fantastic uh, covering a cover up by the UK government, which means most people have never heard of this nuclear accident. And part they of that was they like, rebranded it as Sellafield. And they rebranded it as Sellafield. This is in the 1950s. So if if you Americans think you were the first at uh, mastering branding, the UK in the 1950s were all, already doing a fantastic job. And one of the one of the best jobs they did was to rebrand this nuclear power station. So um, the Cumbria is, is it's, it's home to Britain's nuclear weapons arsenal, uh, but it's also home to the Lake District, which is one of the most beautiful areas of natural, of, of outstanding natural beauty in the country. So actually, you know, I will go uh, to, to the Lake District with my kids and uh, my partner and we'll spend weekends there you know camping by the lakes um but just across uh from the lake district is uh Sellafield and britain's trident nuclear submarine which program which uh just like the us you know the uk has submarines that contain on them missiles that could wipe out the entire planet <laughs> is that right batty have i got that fact right uh, it's 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 also where all of our spent nuclear fuel goes. So it's a massive storage dump, essentially, That's... for the UK's uh, nuclear fuel. 
That's um, right. So it's regarded as one of the most dangerous places in the in the British Isles. And yet it's one of the most beautiful as well. And so we spent, uh, I think we spent two years on this project, kind of researching the area, uh, learning about it, uh, re collecting lots of material about protests that had occurred against um, the nuclear, the dumping of nuclear waste uh, off the coast of Cumbria um, by groups that have since been forgotten. Um, you know, BNFL, the British Nuclear Fuels, who run Sellafield, and BAE Weapon Systems, who um, are basically, uh, they run the submarine program, the nuclear submarine program. They have kind of, they've won the, um, the, the PR battle really big time. Oh, yeah. Um, this is this oh, is Cumbria yeah. here. This really? this was one of our first trips. I didn't want to speak there, but that's never Sorry, Daphne. I think your your microphone's on. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, so this is on a, one of our first research trips to Cumbria because Manchester is um, it's like a, an hour and a half away from from this place. This is a town called Barrow in Furness, and here you can see it's an old port town. And that huge white building there is uh, BAE weapon systems. That's where the sub the nuclear submarines are being built. Uh, this these photos are taken off the um, the BAE website. And the picture before that, if you can just go back one picture, this was on our first research trip. And um, those four red lights that you can see at the bottom are the red warning lights that sit on top of that white structure. So as you can see, the, the BAE factory is set right in the heart of Barrow. So there's people just living uh, right nearby. And in fact, one of the most amazing things that we came across early on in the project was that this entire zone is a kind of evacuation zone. And there are these horrendous warning sirens that will go off and they're being tested every month. Um, because the risk of uh, there's a very real risk of, of nuclear uh, arms going off or of a nuclear accident happening in these residential, right in the heart of these residential areas. This is uh, part of one of the Trident submarine hulls that's being um, uh, transported through uh, the town, basically. So you can see, um, again, we found these pictures today, great pictures um, showing this kind of complete sort of, uh, how do you describe this kind of discord between you know residential and nuclear? I mean, it's like nuclear weapons in the heart of a housing estate. It's it's amazing, absolutely amazing. And also, like I said, if you travel 10 minutes out of the town, you find yourself in an area of outstanding natural beauty. Now, when we were researching the project, we came across this fantastic document called uh, the Energy Coast Master Plan. And the Energy Coast Master Plan was a, is a, was a plan, it's a kind of a strategy, like a, an economic an industrial strategy for Cumbria, for West Cumbria for the next like 30 years. And it's an attempt to try and attract investment into the region. And the real selling point for the region is the, uh, the nuclear energy and leisure and environment related uh, aspects of the area so you can see it's a uh, so really strong and me and batty were we were talking a lot about this document we were fascinated by it it's really well designed the language is great it makes it makes it very attractive and while we were talking one of us made a freudian slip and referred to it as the 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 energy ghost master plan and we thought oh my god that's amazing energy ghost uh we should do something about that because in a way, you know, with, um, I think one of the great things about art is that it can, you can use art to haunt um, everyday, think banal things that we can completely take for granted can be utterly haunted by art in a way. You can use art to introduce uh, an uncanny, a kind of an alternative vision of the very world that we live in. And I think that's one of the things that connects mine and Batty's uh, interests greatly. And um, and we thought energy ghost, you know, radiation, uh, the nuclear threat. Um, th there's so many fantastic things there that tie into the idea of the ghost of of the th the, the thing that haunts us all. Climate change too. I mean, we really believe that climate change is 
is what haunts us today. You know, we hear about it every day. We see it everywhere. We're connected to natural disasters that happen all over the world, you know, in seconds. The mo from the moment they happen, we're connected to them. And, you know, we would have all these discussions about all this stuff. And, and we thought, God, the, let, let, we, can, we can use the Energy Coast Master Plan as a kind of blueprint for this entire project just by changing the letter C to the letter G. And, um, and then we got into the, you know, as we're exploring that whole sort of nuclear infrastructure and military infrastructure, obviously we would come across these really strong graphic symbols of sort of these warning symbols and hazard symbols. And, you know, the, you know, we're both, I mean, Batty's a great designer, but I'm, I too, I'm really, I'm, I love design. I love design as a sort of way of solving communication problems. And there's something about the graphic language of these signs and symbols that is just so brilliant, beautifully effective um, in signaling threats and, and hazards and so on. And it's something we, we were really fascinated by. So we collected a lot of this stuff. We had no idea what we were going to do with it. Um, but we, we, we thought it would be really great to somehow kind of bring that language into our project somehow. And this was a photography project. So the question was, well, how do we, how can we integrate this graphic language into photography? And uh, we continued sort of exploring these signs and symbols. Um, this is another one. This is the, the, the nuclear fallout calculators. Is that right, Batty? They're, they're, they're called nuclear effects computers. And what they were used for was to calculate damage we, you know, to 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 populations and to to resources, uh, based on based on weather and uh, environmental factors, uh, you know, when a, when a, an attack took place. So to us, it was utterly mind blowing that you could reduce the effects of a nuclear bomb going off to, you know five circular pieces of paper connected with a, you know, not a paper clip. What do you call that in the middle, Batty? I've forgotten. A the rivet. Name. Connected by a rivet and you can just spin them around and it will give you a sense of whether people will have died from nuclear fallout or not um, and what the damage would be. Uh, I mean, again, in terms of a, a, a graphic tool, this is extraordinary, really not just as a tool, but also for what it symbolizes. Uh, and we kept coming across these fan this fantastic resources um, over and over again. And obviously, you know, we our project was due to conclude and our exhibition was meant to open on the 4th of April, 2020. And uh, a week before it opened, Britain went into lockdown because of COVID. And, um, you know, we suddenly went from uh, all of these conversations about nuclear fallout and so on, um, and biological weapons and uh, graphic and uh, liter literary language around those things, to suddenly living in a time when, you know, the country went into economic meltdown over a virus, a biological virus. And so it was absolutely fascinating to us. And you know, everything had to move online. So the sh our show, we were asked to put our show online. And we, we, we were really fascinated by uh, it become a kind of passion, this whole project. And we thought, well, we can't just put it online, we have to, I'm, I mean, it, what it was going to be three weeks before being totally shut down, was we were given a space in Whitehaven, a small town, and we were given a, a disused retail space. And we looked into the, the history of the space. And in the 1980s, it was a, a TV shop, a television shop. Um, and then it, in the 90s, it turned into an army, army surplus store. And we thought we'd just meld those together. And so what, what was going to result was uh, an installation that was composed of found uh, LED screens, uh, CRT monitors, whatever we could find within budget. And we were going to play 
uh, natural disasters on all of these 40 screens or so. Um, so it was going to be a cacophony of like natural disaster that you would walk into as a stranger just off the street. Uh, the outside of it, we were going to make make it look like a fireworks shop because we were kind of looking at the relationship between fireworks and nuclear uh, deterrence and kind of the sort of analogous sort of uh, how they sit side by side in essence. And um, so, yeah, that, that piece was cancelled. Uh, so we had to then uh, work online. We were asked to work online and we chose Instagram. We yeah, but Bertie, let me we, we let's just talk about the watermarks first okay. before we go into that. So um one of the things that I mentioned before was this fascination that we had with the um with the graphic symbols around hazardous waste and all of that stuff and uh, biological hazards. And then and an, another thing that we kept coming across time and time again were op optical calibration uh devices and uh, the language of the graphic language of optical calibration. So when you know when you're developing weapons, surveillance systems, etc., you know the cameras have to be really absolutely, um, uh, you know, calibrated to a thousandth of a millimeter. And we kept coming across the. We started researching the this amazing sort of um, yeah this graphic design around optical calibration. And it made us uh, think about the watermark, especially in photography. Um, and um, and we thought we were fascinated by the watermark because it, it, it's a way in which, um, you know, photographers kind of try and put their own stamp uh, on their images. But actually you could create a watermark and put them on any image in a way. And we really love that sort of tension between, uh, you know, what if what if we made <laughs> what if we made watermarks that were the original work, the image itself? I mean, it didn't matter what the image is, but the watermark was the work. And then, so we developed what Batty's showing you here now is is some early developments of what Energy Ghost as a watermark might look like. If you just go back a couple of slides, Batty, I think that's the, the, these were what the the two very first ones that we played with, where we played with the idea of E and G, so the letters E G and uh, as a watermark, and then obviously you know the more we played with it, the more we realised that there are infinite sort of variations of E G as a watermark that we could play with, and um, so. We, as we moved the project onto Instagram, we thought that actually uh, another aspect of the project that we could explore was this tension between beautiful images of nature and horrific images of nature. And um, so uh, these are some of very early images showing how we th we thought you might be able to integrate these watermarks into. Uh, on, on top of photographs. Uh, this is, these are posters here, just to go back to Batty's point about the fireworks. We thought some, at one point, one of our project ideas was to, I mean, in England, what they have still, I live in a really um, uh, mainly black and uh, Muslim community. And the, uh, the black churches here, I don't know if they do this in America, but here they still have these incredible hearses that are like carriages that are pulled by horses for funerals and uh, so you'll have the coffin in uh, this carriage that's being pulled by four beautiful black horses um, and um, we thought initially wouldn't it be great to build the world's biggest firework and uh, have a procession through Barrow uh, so a four horses like the, the horses of the how many horses of the apocalypse were there and the four horsemen yeah. so four so four horses pulling um this carriage carrying the world's largest firework and then we thought we 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 could launch it uh so we we could do a whole event where we launched the world's biggest firework over the uh ba <laughs> nuclear 
plant basically uh but we would fire it and it would be a dud it would be a ghost firework there would be it would never it wouldn't go off it was a conceit right it was a crazy idea and the project commissioners weirdly weren't too keen on us doing that uh so we didn't do it but these are some of the designs go on Batty, if you if you carry on we these were some of the designs we came up with for how you might package a firework we thought it could be really interesting to actually design and try to sell a firework in it's relation all inspired to... by the the sub the trident sub as well yeah the aesthetic yeah so the the military the, the aesthetics of military design are obviously something also that we find absolutely fascinating um and and um and that's something we're playing with here and um and that actually extended to we we then extended that to um survival gear so we then thought well what what we're building here essentially is a brand right we thought well energy ghost is a brand really and you know how north face or um what are some of the others north face low um anyway everybody knows north face you know north face has this all, all of these outdoor adventure and leisure brands have this kind of openly conquering sort of man conquering nature right that is very much the subtext of it you know all the ads are um who's that painter who painted the the, the guy on top of the mountain um really famous uh, picture Friedrich uh Casper De is it Caf Casper David, David Friedrich, Friedrich. yeah yeah. And what's the, what's the picture called? What's the painting called? Oh. Anyway, you all know it, right? You you can all you all see that image of the man conquering nature by standing on the peak of the mountain. And that is basically North Face. You have all these brands that are all about, you know, whoa, let's get out there, man. Let's conquer, let's go mountain biking, let's climb the rocks, all of that. Yeah, we're conquering it. You got this um all of that culture and we thought well what if what if we designed a brand that was about natural disaster so no one's coming out of this alive right so it, you know nature has the potential to wipe us all out let's do what if the brand was that what if our client was nature nature at its very worst i say worst because worst for for humans um and uh, and so we des we developed all this survival gear, um, and uh, you can see some of the stuff here. And we were thinking actually maybe that's something that we should do. That and in fact, when you offered us the show at Blue Sky, we thought actually we should do a show purely of survival gear. Um, but we kept thinking, well, Blue Sky is a photography gallery, so we need to get some pictures in there. It's not enough just to have survival products uh, on the sh on shelves. What's the next picture, Ratty? Uh, this is a, a glow in the dark emergency yeah. signage. Yeah. So again, just showing you how um, much fun we were having. This is my daughter that's uh, coming in. Um, uh, this is just showing some of the threads that we were sort of exploring. Um, and we were invited by Jean Baudrillard's wife. Actually, I don't know if you know Jean Baudrillard, but I grew up, he was like an idol of mine. I studied him a great deal um, in the 90s when I was a sociology student. And uh, this was an, a show put on by the University of Quebec. Um, and they invited us to show Energy Ghost in a, sh in, a, in a kind of homage to the work of Jean Baudrillard, who was a fantastic uh, philosopher, writer, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, he wrote a lot about America, actually. He was fascinated by America um, and argued that America was no longer, had no longer had any connection to the real whatsoever, that every single thing in America, everything, the very idea of America, every part of America's landscape was a simulation of a simulation of what America might be, right? So it's, uh, you know, you have the invention of Hollywood, you have the invention of uh, the car, not not just the car, but the road trip. 
one of the best things he wrote was for me was about how he describes driving through America and uh, the car windscreens were like cinema screens. So we, you're in your car driving through the American landscape and because because so much of America exists on film in cinema history, so much of our relationship to America is a is a cinematic one that everything in seen from the car is just a cinema screen. So the all of America's landscape is a cinema screen, basically, just really quite mind blowing ideas at the time. Um, and so we we exhibited, so we made a film uh, and you can see in some of the imagery, you see some of those watermarks that we've placed superimposed over films of natural disasters. Uh, I mean, all, all, all this film footage is most of it is taken from dash cams. So uh, so back to yeah. this, of the, the screen, the, the, the car windscreen being a screen, uh, a window. Um, yeah. But there are cameras everywhere. So uh, whether it's eyewitnesses who are going on a walk and then a, suddenly a mountain dissolves in a gigantic landslide, or whether it's people going shopping on a coast on a coastline and then suddenly you know a tsunami hits them uh, all of this stuff is is recorded so all of our footage was found footage uh online and we just imposed each time we superimposed each time an, an energy ghost watermark over this footage so we collected footages of hurricanes um yeah landslides earthquakes um thunder strikes um what else is there uh, snow blizzards snowstorms avalanches um tsunamis um i mean all horrific all grim stuff really that we we never featured humans in them apart apart from the op the camera operators that there are rarely humans in our video footage but there is all there are always traces of humanity so whether it's a house a car park floating cars buildings roads um humans are always there but they're kind of absent um and um and we presented them in this kind of scope uh format so uh this kind of black circle that surrounds the image uh, the stuff is is again reference to the the submarines and uh, the submarine scope and military scope. scope yeah yeah, and how we kind of detach ourselves. There's this detachment from the reality when we look through the scope. And the sound, and the soundtrack. From... Yeah, and the soundtrack to the film, which you can hear in the gallery, hopefully, yeah. uh, is, is "God Save the Queen," but slowed down to something like three percent. So yeah, so in the gallery, the sound, this kind of, there's this low humming sound that is "God Save the Queen." reduced to an incredibly slow speed and so this bombastic sort of colonial uh imperial soundtrack is kind of reduced to this sort of low threatening ominous ominous, ominous kind of drone drone uh which we thought was really fantastic um again uh what's the next image what are the next image is by uh so yeah, we were invited to do this show, and um, what we, we, this show was happening whilst we'd started, or we we were about to begin our our long Instagram performance. So basically, the idea was to put was to create a sort of um, an Instagram feed that would be a it, would, it was a durational performance that would start with very beautiful sort of depictions of nature and would slowly descend into this darker, more menacing and threatening kind of uh, depiction. And, uh, you know, we, we did a lot of research about different communities online that used Instagram to sort of celebrate nature. And we would try and kind of infiltrate them or, or use the language that they would use. Um, we would tag our pictures with hashtags that, um, that, that, that would relate to, to those communities. Um, and, uh, these were some of the logos that, uh, we designed to, as a kind of identity 
for the account. Was this the first one? I think this was the first it, one. This, this, yeah, this is the avatar that we created. You know, it's based on a profile image of a of a of a being. You know, a head and shoulders, but also it, it's a it's a volcano erupting uh, in graphic form, uh, which was kind of a, a Nietzschean kind of uh, way of looking at the self as a volcano and not knowing when it's going to erupt. Um, and we're all capable of of this activity uh, the background is colors taken from uh these sort of sun this sunset lava-esque coloring that instagram uses so yeah it was very much a bespoke bit of branding for instagram and so I, were, to... sorry go on I, I, I i mean just as a as an influence we were we were looking at the work of chris burden was it chris burden who's who 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 hired advertising space on terrestrial television uh, and and performed uh, pulling himself through shattered glass naked you know and the, this kind of we were thinking you know also of these activist groups who hadn't quite infiltrated mass media how could we merge them together you know and and be inspired by that and and maybe do something on instagram so we we started the project with sunsets. We couldn't go in with natural disasters. You know, we started off posting at 11 p.m. Uh, the 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 last hour, um, and we posted for 365 days, starting with these really kitsch images of sunsets and our romanticized view of of nature, very much conventional, and then moving into more corrosive and kind of uh, uh, abrasive images of, of natural disasters. Again, beautiful, but not really conventionally seen as beautiful. Yeah, um, we found, we, we, th we thought Instagram was really fascinating in that it, it, Instagram kind of hosts both, doesn't it? There's, there are so many accounts that specialize purely in disasters, right? And then, so from an aesthetic point of view, it's as if, Something like Instagram has the entire spectrum of uh, what do you call it from of extremes, from this kind of blind. Uh, well, it's a sort of modern sublime, isn't it? Sublime with no horror. Sublime because the idea of the sublime really was about horror um, and vulnerability. But now the sublime is thought of as a selfie taken against a beautiful landscape, you know, oh, isn't it sublime? Um, and uh, and what, what Batty's showing you here is how some of the, our pictures would find themselves, because of hashtagging, they would find themselves in this community of, you know, uh, find your epic or Britain outdoors, you know, which were very uncritical, very uncritical aesthetic depictions of nature. I mean, what lots of bums and lots of bum cheeks and sunsets, actually. Instagram's full of them. Um, yeah, naturalism meets narcissism. I mean, it's a, a fascinating combo. You know, these people, Peaches and Peaks is, is people conquering nature, getting up mountains and then showing their buttocks. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, fun, it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice combination. But completely uh, uncritical and, you know, I mean, what the hell's going on? It's just, it's it's bizarre. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll come on to that. Um, <laughs> warheads on foreheads. I mean, so, the, but, the hashtag yeah. alone was just a, a project in itself. Um, 365 days of hashtagging. Um, yeah, and and discovering all these different different hashtags was a lot of fun. Yeah, so if you want to see the whole performance, you can you can go to our Instagram page, which is uh, Energy Ghost Instagram dot com forward slash Energy Ghost, which is like coast but with a G. So um, you know, I think this is a project that's going to last for years, really, because there's so much in it for us as artists and designers and thinkers. 
uh, it's kind of endless, really. And, and we find that so many of the ideas, they just they, they don't stop being relevant. And, um, you know, when we when we were offered this show at Blue Sky, we were thinking a lot about merchandise, uh, but not actual merch, not actually making the merchant, not not selling merchandise, but working with the idea of merchandise. And again, you know, the website we use to make the yoga mats, uh, you can get leggings printed on there or just go through them, Batty. Or um... well, well, it's 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 is it drop? Is it drop drop shopping? Um, drop shipping, yeah, drop shipping, drop shipping. Yeah, you just you just upload an image, and it instantaneously uh, carves it around whatever object it is that you're you're looking to buy. So you, we had so much fun just u- uploading these images, and within yeah. seconds, it's like video- ph- it's like photography is a kind of completely elastic sort of mold that can fit around anything. Right. So using image mapping, it's brilliant. All this, this, I mean, you know, we didn't pay anything to get this done. Right. It, we've never actually had these, uh, the, these items of clothing made, but visually, you know, we're using, we're using the tools offered by these companies to project our images of natural disasters onto these products. I mean, this is one of my favorite images. Actually, if you go back, Batty. You know the flight case, and uh, I think it was Paul Virilio, a, another brilliant, a sort of contemporary of Jean Baudrillard, a French philosopher, who said that with the invention of the ship, uh, there is also the invention of the shipwreck. Right? Um, it's like with the invention of the car, is the car crash, and um, and you know I just love how you can sort of put any material onto these objects. And we can, and they become real in a sense. So, you know, we can feel them, we can touch them. They become tangible, even though they're entirely, completely intangible. But, uh, you know, me, neither me or Batty are, are, are very good consumers. So for us, the, the sort of, just the idea of it all is fantastic in itself. And in a way, photography has moved on to a level where we can, we can use photography, not as documentation, but as imagination. Uh, which I think has has been a really super interesting development, and obviously with AI, that's going that's going to an even another degree now. But look at that as a tablecloth. I mean, or car seats. I mean, um... <laughs> can, can I just remind you, Mishka? Some of the inspired us with this with this project was um, a couple of years ago when you were traveling through the airport and you sent me a photograph of the tobacco section oh, of yeah. the duty free. And now I don't know what this is like in the States, we have our tobacco packaging has been uh, completely revolutionized a few years ago where it was just turned to brown. Everything was brown and you had an image of some sort of anti-smoking campaign, uh, really powerful images of like rotten feet, you know, gangrene, gangrenous feet and and people on deathbeds and, you know, and, we, and the, the, the shelves, of these tobacco products were just full of these horrific images, really graphic, horrific images. And and we thought, shouldn't all packaging have this on? Yeah, shouldn't, we were thinking of, yeah, shouldn't we were th- you be, shouldn't you be aware that every tin of beans that you buy is is gonna feed into this disaster, you know? So let's brand everything. Let's brand everything with this imagery. So that we're constantly aware of it. Yeah. So, for example, you know, I love bacon, but the, the, there's a there's a there's a direct link now between sodium nitrates using cheap processed meats like bacon and cancer. And so, you know, it makes absolute sense that food packaging in processed foods should also be horrific, right? I mean, it should be. It shouldn't be selling you a dream. It should be selling you the nightmare um and they do that with cigarettes that's right in the uk now all cigarettes packaging must be the most disgusting design possible to put people off from smoking and so why aren't they doing that with processed foods why aren't they doing that with gambling uh ads um 
And so anyway, yeah, we so we thought, God, it's amazing that actually you can use these sites now to sort of to create these sort of incredible connections between these two completely competing worldviews, if you like, that we exist in. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, yeah, this is a catalog that we were working on. We're both extremely particular and perfectionists when it comes to like um, the tiniest details. So we haven't got this out yet, um, but uh, hopefully it'll come out soon. Uh, but you can follow us on Instagram, uh, Energy Ghost, and we have a website, energyghost.cargo.site. Um, and yeah should we open it up to questions or is there anything else you wanted to add batty uh no that's good thanks mika mika and vasim that was amazing i um i think it's just fascinating the the endless possibilities that feel like that can happen with this project and when you had posed the when i'd asked you you know how to, how would you pair the video with something else to fill the space and i was so excited when um, you would come back with the yoga mats idea because it was just so so different and especially for blue sky to have something that's more of an interactive experience I was just like yes <laughs> this is going to be really cool um, and it yeah it is it looks it looks amazing and um, for those who can come and see it I think what's super fascinating is the idea of like your Instagram as performance um, and so therefore your yoga mats each individual yoga mat is is looks like uh, an individual Instagram post, which I think is great. Um, so I just had my quest first quick question and then we'll de people who have questions for, for the artist can put them in the chat or if you want to just raise your hand um, and ask directly. Uh, but I was curious about your followers and like, um, it looks like you have some people that are like comment a lot. Like I've noticed there's like, what was the, there's one called Peach something. And I was just curious if like, those are just people that you random like that, came upon you or is it people that you know, knew already or how that how that kind of part of your performance like comes into play it, it was very time consuming as you well know as many of you will know about instagram it just wants your time it just wants your energy and so you know it a lot of time was just spent looking at people and befriend befriending people that you would never want to know. You would never really, in the real world, would really never want to know, you know. Um, and and they they came in from the start. And because it was such a slow project, 365 days, no one really realized that it was turning into horror. Um, you know, it was very, very slow. Mishka described it as glacial, um, you know, and, and we kind of, I like the idea that, you know this this uh, hypothesis that a, a toad in in water. If you throw a toad into boiling water, it'll jump out. Okay, knee jerk reaction. Uh, if you put a toad in in water in in room temperature water and slowly heat it to boiling point, it will die, but it will not realize that it's dying. You know, and I think that's analogous to where we are, and that's why we did this slow, drawn out project where we were grooming people. To, to come and in, you know love our sunsets and our landscapes and and then it slowly slowly turned to horror very slowly um you know it was a lot of fun as well um to infiltrate the minds like i mean me and mishka talked about radiation and the effects of imagery being akin to radiation and how it can uh, affect cognition and uh, like warp and mutate us um, into different ways of thinking. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite uh, comedians is a guy called Bill Hicks, an American comedian. And uh, he's, I mean, he died young, but uh, he has this brilliant um, thing where he says, uh, you know, he's watching CNN and there's, you know, there's an earthquake here, there's an avalanche there, there's a tsunami over here, there's a massive riot over there. And then he turns the TV off, goes to his window, looks out and says, 
where is all this shit happening? And um, I feel like, you know, we live in an age where we are constantly haunted by these images. You know, they pass through us. But what happens to them? What what do they do to us psychologically? You know, do you know, there's this idea of compassion fatigue, right, in photojournalism um, that, you know, too much photography of war just, you know, turns people off. They just turn it off like with the war in Ukraine now. You know, every day you go on the Guardian website, the, a, a newspaper I read, and, um, you know, it's like day day 342, what's happening in Ukraine. You just switch off. But People you know, are, yeah, are we... switching off en masse. They are switching off, you know, mean world syndrome. These have got terms now, doom, doom surfing, doom scrolling. You know, it's, it is uh, paralysis, overstimuli. Um, but they're ghosts. They're there. You know, mm. there's this idea that, you know, you see ghosts in the corner of your eyes. So if you're in a haunt, I've, I mean, I've done this myself. I'm a bit superstitious, uh, you know, uh, just look straight ahead. Tunnel vision. Don't look in the corner of your eyes because that's where you see apparitions. You know, <laughs> um, and, and it's the same with it, with how do people in, in the Lake District live? You've got this area of outstanding beauty. I mean, it, it's not really. It's it's a monoculture. Biologists see it as a as a devastation, uh, uh, as a catastrophe, really, because uh, biologically is a is a monoculture. But we've romanticised it as being somewhere where we aspire to go on holiday. Uh, but you've got this these people living in under the threat of uh, a catastrophe, nuclear catastrophe, and it being uh, a no go area. Uh, the whole of the Lake District. You know, just like that. Um, it, back in 1959 or where, whenever Windscale was, a di the, the disaster at Windscale took place, uh, it w the people were told not to drink milk for two years, cow's milk, um, because of that disaster, you know, and that could quite easily happen today. I mean, it's a fascinating place. You know, BAE Systems, you've got this multi-billion pound venture. And then within 100 metres of it, you've got a heroin epidemic. Um, it, it's, it's, you saw those shots of the subs, you know. People live in these tiny houses in a deprived area. It's very sad. Um, uh, but fascinating. Sorry, did we go off piece there? <laughs> That's all good. Um, anybody? Oh, uh, looks like Ralph Wells, you have a question. Go ahead, Ralph. You should be able yeah. to. Oh. Yeah, I do. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm a uh, uh, member of the exhibition committee at Blue Sky. Um, uh, when 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 we have gone on travels, there is, you know, some some places you need a guidebook and people recommend a lot of guidebooks and other places uh, you you just need to know that you're there and things will take care, care of themselves. I find that that this piece needs not only a lot of guidebooks, but an awful lot of references, a lot of history and and a lot of connections that are just not part of my own experience these are part of your experiences but not our experiences my my experience so so i just wonder um uh how much how much to uh, have this be an effective piece of work how much do you have to bring to it I have to say that I learned a great deal just from this about how it was put together and the purpose of it and the fact that it's really an ongoing piece and not sort of a static piece. But I also know that I experienced those photos and those disasters completely differently from the intent that you have. So I just want to talk about that as an experiential piece of work. But also for you, it's almost not not almost. It sounds like it is not just a project, but a crusade at the same time. And I do find, in my experience, a disconnect between that. So well, I'd, I'd I'd love to hear, Ralph. What did you what did you get out out of it? I mean, that would be really interesting for us to hear. Well, what what I got out of it was the uh, because it was the imagery that I was paying attention to. 
and uh, and for me, the the imagery of just the dash cams of the of the overwhelming surprise and sort of ease with which the earth can can move. And, mm -hmm. and and there were many times when I gasped. I just gasped. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. But the imagery, sort of the 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 sights and the crosshairs and all that, uh, I I was aware of that because because we looked at this in the exhibition committee. But um I but um that was information that I need to needed to bring to it in order to understand it a little more. So yeah. I was I was responding to to the event itself, and I know that behind that was all of this work that you put into it. But for me, it was just this weird kind of surprise at how often the world can just turn into mush, you know. And, well, that's fantastic. And, and I was a surprised in its experience, but not. But it didn't mean that the world was falling apart. It was just, oh my god, I'm experiencing this in this in this way. So anyway, thanks. No, listen, I mean, that's brilliant feedback. It really is. I think the first thing to say is that gasp, it, that gasp that you had is what I always look to achieve when I make work. I want, I always want the audience to, to gasp, <laughs> right? So in a way, um, thanks, because uh, I feel like we managed to achieve something really fantastic there. The research we do, you know, is uh, how do you describe it? You know, at the end of the day, you know, we're not academics. We're not presenting a research document here. We're trying to create a kind of aesthetic experience that's going to have everything we've described in it. But the viewer doesn't need to know that in order to have an, mm. an experience. Right. And I think. I think the problem with so much art is that there is so much explanation now of there's everything. There's so much backstory. This, the backstory overrides the, the effect, you know? What, what, yeah, we, we... What, what, you, you, what you're concerned with, Mishka, is the sublime power of nature. Uh, and that's and what... art. And art. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think... Yeah. I think, I think art, art should make you gasp and it should make you see something that you've never seen before. Even if you've seen it before, it should make you see it in an, in a way you've never seen before, I think. And the result of that, the consequence is that is a, is either a cognitive shift or an emotional shift. I don't know. I don't know what it is because I'm not a, you know, that's not, I, I just I know that we're constantly looking for something that makes us gasp. And, you know, we would collect that material and it was just incredible, extraordinary, the material we'd collect. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's not just enough to just take something and just shift the context slightly by putting in a gallery. You want to you want to add something else to it, too. And but with a lightness of touch. And I think that's what we're kind of always striving for. For me, anyway, my work, I'm always striving for a kind of lightness of touch. You know, I don't want to hammer people over the head with a message. Um, you want them to sort of have their own kind of experience. And yeah, obviously we're doing a talk here. So this has turned into a bloody lecture. But that, <laughs> that is the last thing that art should be. Art should not be a lecture, I don't think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, then I'll I'll just say that that it that it worked perfectly on me because it was the gasp that you that the work was it was working on me in the way that you expected. Well, that's, that's the really gasp. Cool. The gasp was it worked, and and that's what I got out of it. I think all of this, as you said, the backstory is fascinating, but the fact that I responded to it with the gasp, sort of, that's it. <laughs> that was that's, what that's I did. It. Thank you. Yeah, because you know we yeah. could have presented so many documents. You know, there's so much material, amazing material that we've come across, and it's hard for us not to because. You know, we love it so much. And we gasped when we found some of that research material too. 
it, there was there was one piece that was like over gasp you know it was it was uh you'd done we'd taken lightning lightning bolts the moment a lightning bolt hits and we'd condensed we'd made a, a month like a a, co a collage of of how many i mean how many were they michigan how long it was about were they? it was about 120 thunder strikes but each one a second long so you only heard the crack of one thunder before it cut to the next thunder so it was like i think it was two minutes of continuous thunder strikes and we we played it in that first gallery where we were supposed to have our show and it was like electricity i've never experienced that before but it was like the the the, the video on the wall the video projection was like electricity passing through yeah, our bodies it was, it was a, just it was a primordial feeling that... it was too much it was like being electrocuted but by imagery and sound um which was extraordinary really and we might that you know that might come out we might show that another time um i don't know look we have our prejudices and stereotypes of what the west coast of america's like and what portland's like right so we thought ah oh, we've got to do yoga in portland we've got to do yoga mats we've got to go with a whole north face uh brand survival gear yoga loving culture i mean we might we we could be completely we could be way off but it was still an interesting exercise i think that was you, great i think it's also sp spot on mishka and i think our audiences really responded to that um and uh, I, I do appreciate the personalization of really keeping blue sky and our audience in portland in general in the region in, in mind i think i really loved the the logo and the symbol and that idea but young and i were talking about like when you were like oh what else is there we're like there, there's rei there's patagonia like there's so many like i i came from um from new york to move to portland and it's like the fashion here that's the fashion here right it was like such a switch of like everybody's got their outdoor gear and talking about um so i think that was really spot on uh, I'd love to get to our other people have some other hands in the audience. So let's go to Michelle. Next question. Hey there. Um, you're not wrong. I've got a yoga mat, like right in the corner here, I'm sitting on a bean bag. So you're not totally off. Um, and I really, I just wanted to say, I, I thought your project was really wonderful and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing, where this goes um so hopefully hopefully we'll be able to stay in touch i have kind of a, a kind of a hopefully not too dopey question uh, when you were talking about the music and that that is god save the queen slowed way down i'm glad you mentioned that because when i when i was initially watching this the music reminded me i the the whole thing kind of reminded me of Koyana Scotsy. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I love it. Love uh, it. Um, yours is a different flavor, of course, but did that enter your consciousness when you were putting this together? No, awesome. but I mean that that's a key piece of work in, in cultural history, right? Um, especially American film history. So, you know, uh, it's gonna be there. It's oh for yeah, sure. for me. I mean, I was obsessed with um, with that and the other one. Uh, Paul, what was the other one? Power, the, there was Power Catsy. Power Catsy, yeah, with the Philip Glass soundtrack. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, that interplay of. I mean, that's. Do you know what? That's brilliant, Michelle. Because that's absolutely right. If we did this talk again, we need to bring that in because that is those those are seminal pieces of work that have totally gone into our consciousness. And we've never made that link before until you've just made it. But you know what? When we start, when we played that soundtrack, I remember, Batty, I was at your place when we played that soundtrack over some of that imagery and we just thought, that's gold. That is absolute gold. And it's probably because deep down, it, there was the, there's the co Koenaxi yeah, yeah, know, yeah. reference, but oh. we never even mentioned it. It's the first time no. it's been mentioned. But you're no, there's, on... there's, a, there's a drone in um, a track called Host for Seraphim, um, which which I'm thinking of right now. Is that uh, Philip Glass? 
it's not no that's dead can dance uh but you know it's it's totally i've forgotten the director's name it's totally up that street but yeah thanks for making that connection and i mean we, you guys. we were looking at uh volcanic eruptions with with god save the queen uh at drone speed um yeah i mean it, it's funny playing that soundtrack to people and they just don't get it they do, they don't hear the melody in it whereas i hear it every day every time and it, it sticks the earworms in, inside me and i feel nauseous um but that's just what the the national anthem does to me um so we had to use it <laughs> Well, thanks um, again, guys. <laughs> I guess you, I don't know if any of your visitors would have noticed that. Um, you know, I mean, we did think of using uh, your national anthem and, and giving it the same application. We um, tried it. It wasn't as good. No. <laughs> Didn't work. It's too it, ornamental. It wasn't as ominous. It's too. No. There's something about the British, the the British anthem that is just. I don't know. It's, it's, it's got this threatening, this mildly threatening, ominous. The Stars and Stripe is just a bit more sort of hopeful in a in a weird way. I don't know. It just didn't work. Chris, I see your hand up too. Had a question. Yeah, um, well, it's interesting talking about this. I'm gonna, my question is something else, but I was going to say that we also did a show at Blue Sky by Laura Poitras. Um, oh, yeah. That was a uh, um, slow motion video of people coming to look at the World Trade Center devastation site um, with with Oseka and you see in, in slow motion too. So, no, so, slow sound. So sound, yeah. Um, and, uh, and that, so that, there's a precedent there for us too, um, but I wanted to say that when you were when you were likening the uh, referencing the, this sort of experiment with the frog being slowly boiled, uh, I realized that that's that was really my experience because I first saw the your video online. I was sort of searching to see what Mishko is up to because he's a genius and I want to see what he's doing, oh. and uh, and uh, and the experience of that I now contextualize as I'm being shown time lapse speeded up the water boiling so that I can perceive it you know <laughs> so it's being it's being gathered up brought up to a speed where it's like hey wait a minute I gotta jump out of this water and then I think also the the product things you're doing are taking taking the other step to sort of point out to us that we're sitting in boiling water you know and and that we're not noticing it so they, the project has these two sides of making you notice it and pointing out that you're not noticing it, which is a very interesting sort of combination. That's very three dimensional, I think, and and a very powerful experience. So the the other the other work that I've seen that also has that effect of of uh, speeding up the water boiling so you can perceive it is uh, Gideon Mendel's uh, portraits of people standing in front of their flooded homes, and you see yeah. you see a whole bunch of them, and suddenly in your mind it doesn't become this sort of statistic thing it becomes you can picture if the whole world is flooded at once you know so I, I think that's uh I think both Gideon and you guys are doing something really important yeah no that's really interesting I mean I feel like you know men we mentioned before about how um you know social media and it's not just social media it's like broadcast media collapses time and distance doesn't it so you know because when you were talking about the flooded homes, I was thinking about the Japan tsunami, uh, you know, which was just crazy. I mean, that was incredible. That was ex crazy, like absolutely, you know, it's an event that's happening on the other side of the world. But, you know, we live on an island here in the UK and, you know, the, it's as if there was no distance between us and Japan even though there's ten thousands and thousands, there's the opposite side of the world. But the the image, you know, and the live stream, and it's as if our optic nerves are there, you know, our brains are there. They can our brain can put ourselves in Japan and experiencing the horror of that, even though physically we're utterly removed from it. And I think that's one of the great disconnects, isn't it? That is one of the great um 
problems of our time, probably. Because I'm just thinking, like in the, I mean, the moon landing, for example, that would have been an extraordinary moment. But, um, but you know, a hundred years before that, I mean, it would have been newspapers and newspaper stories would only have been written and published maybe a few weeks after events had happened. So, and even then there was no visual record, right? It was just literary with, with an artist's impression of what a battlefield might have looked like. So photography has that sort of in it, doesn't it? Photography has the ability to just utterly collapse time and space, which is why it's such a fascinating form, unlike any other. Um, but yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, again, really great observation. I mean, we I don't think we've even thought of it in, in those terms. We do love tension between things. So if something's one dimensional, two dimensional, it's not enough really for us. We're always looking for something. I mean, I have this uh, sort of mantra really when I'm making work, which is, uh, you know, it's like the holy trinity is this is the combat is is the aesthetic the form and the subject it's like when those three things combine you know you've ne you've got it that's the holy grail in anything that i'm ever making i'm looking for that perfect combination of the three elements coming together and it doesn't happen very often but when it does it's um i feel like in that in those three elements coming together you have like infinite complexity even though you can have something utterly simple very simple which kind of goes back to uh, Ralph's point about, you know, I didn't understand all of this research. I didn't understand all this stuff you were up to. And you kind of think, well, no, that yes, because that's, we're not, we're trying to, we're, we're aiming for that Holy Trinity where the viewer suddenly brings loads of new stuff in because you've, you've nailed those three key things. Um, and in that there's loads of tension, right? like you're describing Christopher in that there is all that tension because those three things aren't going to necessarily be what you expect. They might be opposing. They might be contradictory like the, like the, um, the leggings with images of natural, who the hell is going to wear leggings with a natural disaster on them. They're never going to, but it, 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 you know, it just works. Um, well, that's why I was saying in the chat that I would wear a pair, <laughs> that I wanted a pair. Oh but I think I think the reason why is because I I think the tension in your work also has humor, right? And that also I was just thinking as you're saying, like it collapses time and space, and it's almost like a everything everywhere all at once, right? And you're just being bombarded, and you start to lose really your mind over all of it you know you can't really wrap your mind around it and it becomes very disorienting um and I think the thing that's most interesting to me about your work is that humor that kind of pulls you back you were saying a little bit about like the fatigue that people get compassion fatigue I think that happens and I think what's interesting about your work and the tension there is there's a sense of humor that's pulling people back it's not just this overwhelming you know um all these disasters everywhere happening in every place all at once because of the sense of we can see everything that's ever happened in time that's been recorded and all in one place coming at you. There's a certain sense of um, levity that you bring to it with, with the humor, right? With, and I, that's why I think it's so smart really um, with all the gear, right? It's really one, we're culpable of it when we're we are obsessed with the, our own materialism the gear that we've got to have or this it's adding to it at the same time especially in the pacific northwest why i think it's so funny is because we are so environmentally conscious right but we still have this bias and we still have um guilt and we're still culpable in everything you know even just that that whole rei kind of get the gear culture is just like exactly that that you're kind of calling out um and i think we um that's what artists can do well i think that maybe scientists have struggle with is really kind of getting the point across this because i think if it was more about just the science and the research we might just get lost in it we might just be over our heads so when you're bringing the humor into it it's kind of 
um, calling out the elephant in the room. And I think um, discussions have been great that we've been hearing. People just have uh, coming in and just uh, finding the humor and wit in it and something that's really dark. And I think that's the purpose of humor, right? Is like to take something that's really dark and um, make light of it so we can face it because otherwise it would just be so, so hard to, to face. So I, that's what I think I appreciate the most about your work. Well, and historically, the only person who could tell a king he was full of shit was the jester. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> right on. But we, but we don't have jesters anymore. <laughs> Where are the jesters? What happened to jesters? Whole other project. So great. Well, I mean, that yeah. was... That was that was fun. I mean, that's something that that humor is something that has brought me and Mishka together. That's how we kind of met through humor, and 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 designing that those products was so much fun. You know, as 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 you know, that probably sounds barbaric, but you know, we did. What can you do but laugh? You know, what can you do but laugh at this situation that we're in? We're all part of it. We're all part of the problem. But you guys uh, inspired it because you said, do you, do you want a catalog? And we thought, what? The, they, we, can, we can do a catalog? And then we thought, shit, well, if we're <laughs> going to do a catalog, what are we going to do? And I was, I was saying to Batty, Let, let's not bother, Batty. It's too much work. Got a lot on at the moment. It's not a good idea. And Batty kept sort of digging away at it. And I said, look, if we're going to do it, we should do it. We should do something that's really just, you know, crazy, really just something ridiculous and not and nuts and controversial almost. Right. Because um, what's the point of just showing something that looks nice uh, and it is a is a really nice documentation of the show. And that's how we got onto this. Uh, we ended up with. 384 pages of products and and calling it the winter collection you know it was based on this idea i mean i grew up with catalogs in the home buy things from the home uh, from your catalog these big chunky pieces of 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 books that that were just full of of commodities and um, that's what we made but everything tinted with this 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 horror well you know just so, so you know you know me and batty will ha will literally spend hours discussing typeface and so when the when we saw the, the blue sky typeface we thought we can't publish this we can't publish it like this just so you know why why we decided to like not go ahead with it in that form because we'd li we literally we're, we're such perfectionists about print and typography typography and all this stuff and it was and and even just changing the typeface on the cover we it was like we can't we it, it's like you threw a hand grenade into our um brains we couldn't deal with it we're like oh what do we do what do we do no we can't do it like that oh can we maybe we should no we can't we can no we can't so anyway I mean, just so you know it's funny because you can you can quite easily take a, a low the lowest resolution imagery and apply it in some of this project yet we can't handle uh, a different sans serif font to what we've got i mean that that font is it's actually called british rail and it was designed by uh, our design research unit which is the the governmental design uh, system of the of the UK and in the 70s 60s and 70s so that that font to me is is it goes hand in hand with the 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 rest of the project you know this kind of colonialism and you know well uh, yeah you know the, the god save the queen it's, uh, did you say colonialism did you say colonialism or bolonialism could be <laughs> And I will just say that there is that one, the, the only copy of the sort of prototype version that is not going forward is down at the gallery if you want to see it. And some someday they'll be with the right British Rail typeface. These guys will do a, a another one. But in the meantime, there's one copy at the gallery. Yeah, that's a precious copy. Because that 
to be honest, Christopher, we are so rubbish at getting uh, making decisions that that may well be the only copy that ever exists. Um, <laughs> uh, just because we're, yeah, we're so picky about stuff. I mean, we'd love to find a publisher, but we're just, we're just not very good at that kind of stuff. So we end up just doing it ourselves. <clears throat> but anyway, no, I, I wanted you to know that because, you know, you probably just thought, oh, do you guys want a catalogue? And didn't think that much about it. But for us, it's like you're throwing us, you're literally throwing us a bone, you know, and we're like two dogs just suddenly going nuts because you've thrown us a bone. And you probably don't realize that. Because, <laughs> you know, we go on the blue sky. Batty's, Batty said, oh, you know, they've done them before. They've done catalogs before. And I'm like, really? And I look on the site and you've got like 300 catalogs mm. that you've done in the past. So for you, it's like just probably totally routine. But for us, it was like, oh, my God, a catalog. Holy shit. What could we do? We could go in that direction. We could go there. We could go this. We could do this. But that's but that is one of the for me, that's one of the joys of collaborating. Um, you know, you get to play with a friend, really, um, and have fun. Um, yeah. So even something like the catalog or anything else that you want to throw us, um, <laughs> we'll be glad to play with. But I was going to say just, um, you know, I mentioned before, me and Batty are not really very good consumers. And, uh, you know, we do what we created all these products, but just the thought of actually making the products. I think, Kristen, you saying I would wear those leggings i mean that really would be the end of the world if, and i say it because you know, <laughs> i and i say it because i think it would be a great conversation piece like if somebody saw me walking around in them they're like what the fuck are you wearing right and then you get into this whole conversation and talk about your work and and that's the only reason why i say it is like it really is one of those things where it just like jarring and like catching people's attention and the irony of it and i think like the whole the whole idea of like just like people wearing, I mean, especially it's a, such a Pacific Northwest thing. Like I said, like coming from New York, I always had like black and heels and like here it's like the yoga pants and not just any yoga pants. It's like the brand Lululemon or like the highest fashion yoga pants. So I feel like wearing like just in a sense of like the irony of it like walking around wearing them people will, like look up close and it's like what what is that? Like, what are you wearing? You know? Um, and especially because yeah, like, totally. like we're such a fad for so long with like so many like crazy patterns. And there's like this like MLM, like businesses where women are selling leggings to other women with all these insane patterns on them. And I just like, it's the humor part of it that I, that I just get and I, that I love about the project. And so therefore like just wearing them as an art piece or as a, as a performance itself, right? Like a part of, continuing the performance of the piece i but, there's something there for me in that well i think what terrifies us is that it would take off and then you know two years from now we're, we're on a fortune magazine <laughs> skype because we've turned it into a multi-million dollar fashion brand right that's kind of not really what we're into um that sounds like, a, have a, flag, like a really good indie movie, a really good indie, like our, our flagship comedy. store would be in Portland though. Definitely, yes. <laughs> for sure. Let, let's commit to that. I mean, I can picture a whole, a whole shopping mall just full of, of this disaster consumerism. Um, hey, do you know what? Point, I mean, you know, and, and, and the, the few people that I've shown those products to, you know, I've tested them out on, on, you know, lay people. Focus groups. And, and they've all, you know, most of them have gone, nice colours, you know. Uh, and and you look at, sorry, you're looking at tsunami detritus here. You know, it, I don't care. The colours are nice. Um, I'd wear them, you know. I think that can be definitely uh, made into something. Yeah, you could totally imagine a kind of cult following of, um, yeah, people wearing this stuff as a sort of fuck you almost to um, 
consumerism but the problem is it would be consumerism still and mm -hmm. that's kind of what that's we don't really want to play that game um, is its message so you know one other thing another thing was another idea we had which i think is brilliant and we wanted to do this at blue sky actually but, but we realized there would be actual problems like legal problems about doing this mm -hmm. but i don't know if you know but that you can buy like super luxurious tinned food like canned food you can buy you know quail eggs in a you know what was it batsy quail eggs in a Flam flambéed quail eggs in a pear sauce or a flambéed you can buy flambéed quail eggs in a pear sauce for like forty dollars right buy this luxurious french brand of food manufacturers and we thought god wouldn't it be amazing to just complete buy them and then completely repackage them as if they were like survival foods so, so give, give them the same treatment as they did you know cover them in tsunami detritus for example this soup you know of 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 chaos and 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 we were just going to have a whole range within blue sky we were kind of aiming at the whole prepper culture and then this kind of elon musk kind of you know this sort of uh waiting these waiting rooms uh, that's what we were looking at this idea of a waiting room to leave the uh the mothership you know and yeah what and would jeff bezos what, take some what kind of tinned food would jeff bezos have on his uh what's it called blue the space capsule that he's got um you know we were just thinking like what multi multi-millionaires what might what survival foods would they have you know here in the 1950s people would have bomb shelters they were genuinely anticipating the end of the world and so they would fill their ba their bomb shelters with like tins of spaghetti hoops or baked beans right or um, whatever and so we thought oh what if what if we could create yeah these these luxury foods and art art is about luxury objects and so we thought oh god it'd be hilarious to have these luxury foods at blue sky and we started doing blue origin that's it yeah and we started doing all these designs for shelves in blue sky um that would have that would be home to these tinned to these luxurious tinned foods and we thought god wouldn't it be hilarious to to you'd buy a tin of like flambéed quail eggs in uh whatever sauce for like forty dollars and then you'd sell it in the gallery for like three hundred dollars as a kind of luxury sort of art object that you could also eat um but there is a problem with that because then we have to be licensed if we're selling food we have to be licensed with regulatory authorities and then we thought yeah but we'd be selling art and then so we started researching that and we found that you can't you can't you can't do it it's it's, it's we would be liable it would be a total nightmare um but yeah we we that's hence, something we'd love to do so. came the yoga mats Good idea. and then we we settled with it on the yoga mats yeah hmm. and did Great a yoga idea. session happen in the gallery we're going to do one. We have a members party coming on uh, the Saturday where all the members are coming, getting together. So we're going to have a yoga session, lead a yoga session with our members. Fantastic. Um, I, I thought of a yoga position that I'd love to see photographed on, on mass in there. Uh, it's called duck and cover. Okay. We you shall know, do just, it. Just on the floor <laughs> with protecting your head, you know um in case of nuclear attack we'll do that on saturday with the members and okay, christopher the you. thought the thought did come to our minds that we would package uh the tins as flambéed quail eggs but they would are actually contain our shit <laughs> Well, that's what I was going to say, you know, you could just have the packaging and it not actually have food inside and just have the packaging. I think it'd be just as interesting, even if it, I mean, it, it, I love, it's fun to just have the real thing, but I mean, at the same, at the end of the day, the concept is there um, and that could still come across with the, with the packaging, perhaps Absolutely. maybe another show. Yeah. In the future. The foodie and, edition. <laughs> this has been fantastic. We thank you guys so much for your time. You. Wonderful show. Um, 
really well thought out and it's been really well received. Um, we thank you all for tuning in. We've got some other people. This will be on our um, YouTube channel. Uh, you Young will get it edited a little bit and it'll be that just like all the other things <laughs> that are forever in perpetuity on the internet will be there for everybody to see. So yeah, thank you guys for your time and just great discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, really. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks for having faith in us, for coming along tonight, um, for the brilliant feedback, really insightful and opening new worlds to us that we that were maybe there, but we didn't even see ourselves. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.